Well, hello everybody and happy Valentine's Day. Welcome to the RV Alone in the Universe first anniversary celebration. My name is Megan Grace Lee. I'm a PhD student at UCLA and I am on the researcher team of our great project. Uh, we have a few more friends joining us online today. We have Jean Luc. Hello. Ella. Hello. And Liam. Hi. Okay, cool. Thank you. So today we'll be doing quite a few things. We'll briefly go over the exciting things that are currently going on with our project, um, how your classifications directly contribute to the ECLA SETI pipeline. We'll get to meet our student team. You just briefly saw Ella and Liam. We'll talk about the future goals of the project and we'll conclude with a very exciting Ask Me Anything with Professor Jean-Luc. So throughout today's webinar, feel free to message in any of your questions that you want us to answer during the Ask Me Anything, and we'll be sure to get to them during that segment. So Are We Alone in the Universe has seen a really, really great year. Since we launched last year on this exact day, we have classified over 70,000 subjects. Um, our user's median classification number is four, and the average is actually 34, which is great. We love how much time all of our users are spending on the platform. In total, we have classified over a million times, which is incredible. So big thank you to our 31,000 plus volunteers and a very, very big thank you to our one user who has classified over 59,000 classifications. I'm really excited for them to hit 60,000. Are We Alone has spread worldwide. We are currently available in Portuguese, French, and English. Soon we will also be available in Italian. And if you would like Are We Alone to be available in your language, please reach out to us on Zooniverse and let us know that you are available to translate. We are more than happy to have Are We Alone available to all languages. Something else that's very exciting is I believe that people with sight disabilities are also able to use Are We Alone via the auditory function. On the left is a, a very close bar chart of where we think all of our volunteers are located. This is by a time zone, so it might not have accounted for all the little daylight savings changes, but we're pretty happy to be located all over the world. My favorite part of RV Alone is definitely the talk board where we get to talk to all of you. So here's an example of our user Nohar when they helped name the landing strip which is now the commonly used name for the signal on the right that we have asked everybody to classify as other. Um, I love talking to all of y'all and we are so happy to have started over 18,000 discussions about Are We Alone? So how exactly do your classifications contribute directly to the UCLA SETI pipeline? We are so excited that y'all are working with us and we want you to know that all of the hard work that you are putting in is contributing directly to SETI science and you are helping us look for ET. So UCLA SETI currently observes using the Green Bank Telescope. Um, we will be observing again sometime this year. So we will have that new data from our 2024 search available on the platform in the next few months. And we send all of this data to the big UCLA SETI computer. And this computer is quite powerful. It can be confident that 99.6% of the signals that are sent to it were made by humans. However, this still leaves a 0.4% that may be ET. And these need a closer look at them. Some person needs to look at them. And that person is you, this top 0.4% of signals is sent directly to RB alone in the universe where all of you get to look at them and start categorizing them into different forms of radio frequency interference. We currently believe that most of this top 4% or top 0.4% are made up of radio frequency interference, which again is sent by other people on earth, but that might not be the case. What we do need help with is categorizing all of this different interference into its different morphologies. And that's what you've been doing. So all of your classifications then help our computer learn examples of classified signals. And so eventually our computer will be able to look at your classifications and hopefully classify these signals themselves so that when our computer looks at new signals, it can recognize some of these common forms of radio frequency interference based on your classifications. Now I'd like to invite everybody to meet our student team, but 
one of our student team members couldn't make it. His name is Jeremy. And next we will watch a video from Jeremy and all the things that he would have liked to have told us. Okay, sorry, I believe we cannot hear the sound. Um, yes, I'm going to reshare that. Hello everyone, my name is Jeremy. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a second year astrophysics major here at UCLA. You've probably seen me on the discussion boards before answering some questions about troublesome signals. Other than that, I also do some software development for SETI. I make some programs and help the project run smoothly. You know, all that fun stuff. I first became interested in astronomy when I was pretty young. Um, I'd always kind of just liked space, you know, like, like every little kid, I wanted to become an astronaut as a child. Now, not so much. I prefer to do more like theoretical research kinds of things. I'd always been participating in these types of like science outreach programs. Um, I attended a lot of like conferences for like children and things. My parents took me to a lot of talks but given by like astronomers in our area. So. As a result, I kind of always had this like interest in astronomy and pretty grateful to be pursuing it as a career now. But yeah, so since I was always exposed to science like that as a, as a kid, I also think it's really important that science continues to be shared. Well, I think it's really cool that our project is letting, letting all of you participate by classifying signals. Uh, and thank you very much for all of your hard work. In terms of my career goals after college. I'm hoping to go into engineering for my master's. I'll probably go into like aerospace or something. And who knows, I, maybe one day I'll work for NASA, you know? My goals are just generally that I want to go into like research or some sort of, honestly, any ast astronomy related field. I think I would be happy working in just physics research in general. For my favorite signal, I will ask Megan to post it for you guys. It is, it's not really a particularly special signal. Um, it's just one I have seen a lot while doing some tests and working with my little programs. So it's my favorite one because it's a very familiar one. Once again, thank you guys very much for participa participating in our project and Okay, well, I hope you all enjoyed meeting Jeremy. So now let's meet our other two student team members who happen to be on the call with us. If Ella and Liam would like to unmute and turn on their cameras. And yeah, uh, we can go in any order. If the two of you could just introduce yourselves, maybe tell us your pronouns, majors, and year. Uh, well, my name is Ella. I am a fourth year astrophysics student. I use the pronouns uh, she, her. And when I'm working for SETI, my primary job is communicating with users um, about the signals that they're classifying. I'm kind of the, the one there answering any questions that you guys have about what category it should be or anything else that might come up. Hi, yeah. So uh, my name is Liam. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I am a third year astrophysics student at UCLA, and um, I do a bit of the behind the scenes work on some of the data that we collect. So I take the data that we get from the telescope, I do some, pro I write programs for, so that it can be transformed into the form that you guys see on the website, um, and basically make it readable and usable for us. So example is the pictures that you guys see on the universe. Cool, thank you. And both Ella and Liam have been with the project since before it launched. So we've all been great friends and coworkers for a long time now. 
Okay, could you each tell us how you got interested in astronomy and then maybe SETI if you have a SETI interest? I know we are all astronomy majors, so at some point we got interested in that. Yeah, um, kind of, it was sort of a pipeline for me going from physics to astronomy to SETI. Um, I first got into physics because I won a competition where I got to fly an airplane, which sounds very random. Um, but then I learned how airplanes work and I thought that was the coolest thing on earth. So then I took a bunch of physics classes um, and that kind of, once I hit college, uh, evolved into astronomy interest. And then I had the opportunity to join SETI and work on their communications team where um, I always have been really interested in astronomy and physics education and outreach. So then to be here on SETI's side and helping to increase people's science literacy um, and to also just engage in this really amazing, just SETI as a whole and kind of the conversation that surround it. Um, it was fascinating. So I was really happy to join it. Uh, my my interest in, I think, in astronomy and SETI isn't quite as uh, as much of a spark, I guess, as Ella's where she flew a plane. Um, I just, I think really since the first time I kind of learned that there were other planets and there were other solar systems, and other galaxies and everything. I've just always been interested in space. It's been incredibly fascinating to me, especially how fast and how much there is. Um, and so that was way back in grade school that I first got an interest. But I think it was really high school for me when I first started taking physics classes. And there were some specifications that are special adjacents in astronomy. And I got to learn a bit more about what goes on with the science behind everything that I had heard about um i think i i got really inspired and and ended up deciding to pursue it uh pursue astronomy as a path of study at ucla and i'm so happy i did because i it gave me opportunities like this to work for seti which is absolutely amazing because it it perfectly coincides with the interests that i've had growing up and stuff that i've learned Cool, I love that. It sounds like we are all lifelong learners and lovers of astronomy. Um, so I know you both briefly touched on how exactly your part plays in with UCLA SETI, but maybe if we could briefly recap that and then you could tell us your favorite thing that you have done with UCLA SETI so far. Uh, yeah, so again, I joined with the science communication team. So from the beginning, I have been um, kind of just handling and communicating with people on specifically the notes uh, discussion board on Zooniverse. So anytime you are classifying a signal and then you wanna post and have a discussion about it, um, I am there to check it out, see if you have any questions uh, help and help out in any way that I can. Um, and probably one of my favorite parts of that position is that I get to see pretty much every single signal that people even just want to talk a little bit about. Um, so it definitely made me develop some favorites. Uh, so my favorite category out of all of our classifications is the VIW category, just because it's probably the easiest to classify, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so actually, like Ella, I started out um, as a member of the the um, uh, science communication team. So I was answering questions just like Ella does um, on the Zooniverse discussion board. Um, but eventually that sort of morphed into doing some analytics on the data that we collect um, from Zooniverse and then also from the telescope that we, that we use to collect their data for Zooniverse. Um, and so I have been writing programs now for the better half of a year, I think, um, that and working on programs to take the data that we get from the telescope and process a little bit and convert it into a usable form so that we can actually create those nice pictures and work with that data um, so you guys can help classify. Um, and I think my favorite part about that is um, I really enjoy the writing of the programs and it is a very rewarding process when you run into a problem and you spend a bunch of time thinking about it and finally you get to, to solve it and everything works like it's supposed to. And that is a, a wonderful feeling. So I love doing that. Um, I have to say though, I also really, really enjoyed 
being uh, answering questions on the talk board because so many people had so many interesting ideas about what the signals were and 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 everything about that. And it was just so it was so interesting to interact with all you guys. And I I had a great time. So yeah, um, my favorite signal as well. Um, it's a specific one, um, <laughs> and it comes from like I think it was the reason why I really like it is because it was one of the first signals that I ended up. Uh, saying, wow, <laughs> that one is very interesting. It has a lot of unique features that I think at the, in the beginning, there was really no signals that kind of looked like that. It's got a number of very, very diverse um, traits, I guess, or characteristics that weren't really present in many of the signals before. So I was like, it made me really excited. It's like, so that is my favorite signal. Yeah, thank you. So we have Ella's favorite signal, BIW, a very common classification. Actually, our most common classification is BIW and Liam's favorite signal, the very busy 8460480. Um, he's got like three or so transmitters in there. Anyway, I can really relate to what Liam said about when your code finally works. I know I'm at the point where even just seeing a different error message is a big victory. And also, you both happened to mention how much you loved talking to all the people on the talk board. So uh, RB alone is very special in that it lets every single person in the entire world with internet access, 10 plus, um, contribute directly to science. So if you could uh, both talk about why you think it's important for science to be open to the public, that would be great. And if you would want to share some personal experience about how science being open to the public is meaningful to you, we would also love to hear that. Uh, sure. So I think I wasn't really much of a science kid growing up. I just kind of liked school as a whole. Um, so it wasn't really until high school that I kind of had this realization that, oh, you know, science, but in particular physics is such kind of like the building blocks of the universe and our understanding of the world. Um, so then it kind of grew into this fascination how important it is to teach people science and how better of an understanding of just how the world works through either biology, chemistry, or physics, and all of the subdivisions, um, like that kind of education is. Um, and then it also kind of led into a significance of science accessibility for me and science literacy, because if you're not in a place where you don't have access to those materials to learn about whatever scientific topic you're curious about, um, you're kind of just stuck. So it's very important. Um, in any way, especially with the internet, to for people to be able to learn as much as they want. And uh, pretty much that's it, yeah. Ella, I don't know if all of our viewers will be familiar with the term scientific literacy, and I think that's very important. Could you give us a quick definition of that? I don't have a sci I don't have like a textbook definition off the top of my head, um, but scientific literacy um, is basically your ability to understand a scientific topic if it's presented to you. So um, if you, you're you able to understand basic scientific concepts, like your baseline biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, so it's, I, I think at the end of the day, it's just a general understanding of how the scientific method works, how research works, just so then you can engage in conversation and um, learn more about any scientific topic. That was perfect. Thank you. Uh, Liam? Yeah. Um, so one thing is that when I think a lot of people when they think about science and they think about physics or the knowledge that we have, a lot of people think of like specific people like Einstein, Newton, those people. And I think that kind of gives the wrong idea about what science is about um, because science in itself is a collaborative effort. They, as, as brilliant as those as Newton and Einstein are, they wouldn't have gotten to where they were without the foundations that were set by people before them, looking at stuff and, and coming up with ideas. Um, so I think, I think inherently for me, the important part about science is the collaborative aspect of it, where everyone's working together, everyone's putting their minds together to build on top of each other and, and produce something that is amazing. Um, and so for me, that's sort of what, SETI does is it combines everyone's ability to, and in this case, the universe, uh, ability to look at something and analyze it and harnesses that into a much powerful entity that can, that can 
help us do a lot more. Um, and so I think that aspect is really important. And also the, the general education um, of everyone learning more about our universe is very important because when everyone knows more, everyone can contribute more, which is a very important thing to science as a whole. Um, yeah, I think that just about sums up my my thoughts on on that. Um, was there, there was another part of your question, I believe. I don't remember which part that was. Um, I guess if you had like a personal experience about how like uh, science being open or how, you know, in the past, maybe if science was more open, could have helped you in your career or your pursuit of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would say that I think I was very lucky to have a lot of access to science growing throughout through high school, especially once I got to college, there was, you know, accessible every turn. Um, and even, even way back in grade school, I had, I had a lot of access to that stuff. But I think for me, I was able to, very thankful because I was able to um, go last, last summer, last spring, last summer. Um, and I was able to go back to where my high school was and present for one of my teachers, my old teachers, to a, a class of a bunch of students um, about what I was doing. And I was really excited to talk and I <laughs> I may have talked for a bit too long, um, but I was really excited to give that opportunity that I had when my teachers would call on other people to present and get people excited about things back to students at, from my school. So that was, I think I was very excited to do that, yeah. Yeah, that's really great. I love when um, students are able to go back and like sort of touch their community again by inviting them to the new science that they're doing. This is an open invite to anybody who's ever been one of my teachers before. I will gladly come into your classroom and make all of your students play Are We Alone? Um, anyway, I also really like what you said about science being collaborative. I know when I first told my family I wanted to be an astronomer, uh, my grandpa said something like, oh, you're going to be very lonely living at the observatory. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm going to live near university and be super happy and surrounded by friends and colleagues all the time. Um, which brings me to my final question is, so you are both very impressive students. You're at one of the top universities in the world and you're studying the best subject, astrophysics. So what are your career goals for after college? Uh, currently, I am in the process of applying to master's programs. Um, my aspirations are to pursue physics and astronomy education and outreach, which is why uh, I really love my position here at SETI because it kind of relates back to that. Um, so I want to help develop curriculum and the pedagogy surrounding physics and astronomy because I feel like it's a very complicated to teach topic that's not always done as well as it could be. So there's always improvements we could make um, to make education in these topics more accessible and then hopefully inspire new generations with it. So I'm, I'm not quite, I'm in my third year, so I'm not quite in the process of applying to grad schools just yet. But um, I think ultimately my goal or my career can go one of two ways. And I'm still kind of deciding where I want to go with that. Um, the first one is I would love to pursue, I've been always really interested in pursuing a doctorate and eventually research at, um, at a university um, to really get into the boundaries of what we know um, in various fields, specifically astrophysics, because that's where I'm really interested in. Um, but I'm also, I also am really interested in the data science and data analysis side of of um, of this career, I guess. Um, so there's also a possibility if I don't go to grad school that I'll end up um, going somewhere in the industry and doing some work there in an astrophysics or astronomy related field. Um, I know Jeremy mentioned earlier, maybe NASA, um, which would be really cool or another space agency. I would love to, to potentially do, be doing research or work for them, which would be awesome. Well, thank you both. I'm sure all three members of our student team are going to go to great places. Let's thank them all again for joining us today. And we'll see y'all later. Cool. So now that we've heard what's next for our students, let's talk about what's next for Are We Alone? So I mentioned earlier that um, are We Alone will help our computer to understand the different categories of radio frequency interference that are making it into that 
top 0.4 might be ET category. Uh, so the publications about that work will hopefully be out in the next few years. And I was able to present some preliminary results of that work at the American Astronomical Society just last month. What's currently live on the platform is that we have been uploading fainter signals to hopefully increase the sensitivity of the computer to understand the different RFI classes. So a few of you have noticed this, that the signals do appear noisier than usual, or it's been harder to identify some of our favorite friends. I think this one is a VIW with a friend on the side. Um, but anyway, you are all very advanced classifiers at this point. And so I'm sure some of these noisier signals are uh, just a really fun challenge for y'all. But the goal is that these noisier signals will make our computer more sensitive to a possible fainter signal from ET that might just be either the transmitter is not turned on as high or it's farther away. Uh, here's an example of one of those fainter signals, subject 960-85305. Our other hope is to use metadata to identify the different interferers that are actually sending these RFI to us. So you can also help us with this project right now. If you go to any subject that has been posted to the talk board and click on the little eye signal at the bottom right of the picture, you can see the subject metadata. So I know all these letters look like some kind of you know code words, but the ones that we're really interested in are frequency labeled FREQ and drift rate labeled as DFDT. Our hope is that with these two identifiers, we will be able to figure out just which satellites are sending each signal. So hopefully eventually we can say something like DIW is coming from a GPS satellite and that'll just help us better understand our RFI environment and hopefully make our computer better at looking for ET. So if you'd like to get started in collaborating, feel free to start looking at this metadata and you can um, look at the communications by the FCC and hopefully be able to link up a satellite to a class. And finally, our last segment of the day is the Ask Us Anything. So thank you to everybody who has been sending in your questions in the chat box. Now we're gonna re-invite up Professor Jean-Luc who's gonna be here to answer all of our questions. Hello. Hello. Okay. Well, it looks like our audience is shy and there's not too many questions. Yes, I believe I just have two. So our first question is, why do we think ET will contact us using radio waves? That's a great question. We don't know for sure. And there are multiple ways to look for ET. And I think because we don't know which particular mode of communication ET might use, uh, it's wise to try a variety of approaches. Um, However, radio has a number of advantages, and that's why at UCLA SETI, we've been focusing on radio SETI. Um, for one, um, the radio waves propagate really well through the galaxy. There's very little attenuation, and therefore we can establish contact with transmitters that are on the other side of the galaxy, which would be possible with optical uh, communications, for instance. Another good reason is that our own atmosphere is very transparent to radio waves. And even with cloud cover or rain, we can still receive signals. So that makes it easy to communicate at radio wavelength. Uh, another reason is that it's extremely efficient to communicate with radio waves. They're sort of the lowest energy waves that we can generate and therefore they're cheap to generate. Um, so if you're budget conscious, uh, radio waves is the way to go. And then, of course, there's the potential for encoding uh, the communication with a lot of information. And so if we are so fortunate as to detect a signal from ET, we will certainly be looking for any potential modulation of that signal or any other signal in the same direction that could contain information. Cool, thank you. Um, our other question is whether or not we have any guesses of what may be causing the interference that our users see. Well, there's lots of sources of interference, some of which we are uh, 
pretty confident about, like uh, global positioning system and similar satellites that send specific waveforms at specific frequencies. Um, but there are other interferers. There's other kinds of satellites. There's aircraft reconnaissance systems. There's um, all kinds of radar systems. There's <clears throat> occasionally unintentional interference, like radio noise produced by elevators or microwaves or uh, gears and that, that operate the telescope. So all of these are potential contributions to uh, the interference environment. And it is in fact the biggest challenge for Radio SETI is the uh, discrimination between terrestrial interference and a real signal from an extraterrestrial source. Okay, thank you. And I have one last fun question for you. So you mentioned that ET would be able to encode something in a radio wave should they be sending us one. What are you hoping that they're encoding to us? Oh, um, we're getting really speculative now, right? <laughs> um, again, we don't know if uh, any civilization is actively transmitting, uh, but if they are, uh, it is possible that they would want to transmit something interesting and possibly some of the knowledge that they've acquired. And what's really exciting about SETI is to think about the possibility of establishing contact with a civilization that is much more advanced than we are. Um, we've developed a technology in the last 100 and 150 years or so, and that's a tiny, tiny slice in the history of the universe. And so if we detect another civilization, the, the likelihood is extremely high that it will be more advanced than we are. And so we have the potential to potentially learn from a civilization that is considerably older and wiser than So that's what I'm looking for. I get asked that question a lot. My answer is always that I'm hoping for instructions on how to message each other more quickly, because if somebody is across the entire galaxy, it will take a very long time to send texts back and forth. But anyway, thank you so much for answering today's questions. Everybody, please thank Professor Jean-Luc for coming to our Ask Me Anything and answering all of your questions. Thank you, Megan. Cool. So that concludes today's first anniversary webinar. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we really appreciate all of the time that you spent with us not only at today's webinar, but of course, all of the time that you spend classifying signals on Are We Alone. I will see you all on the message board and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.